Really? Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks for coming today to Spine Conference. And today we're going to discuss a case of split cord malformations. Um, when I first, um, just a second. Uh, when I when I was a resident, we called these cases diastematomalia, um, but um, that's basically the old term. We'll get into what that term means. Um, but diastema just means a cleft, and when you type diastema in Google Images, it brings this up, which means a, it means a split in the front teeth. That's what dentists use it for, diastema. But it just means a split or a cleft in Greek. And myelia just means the marrow, which means uh, spinal cord. So diastema matomyelia, which is usually the, is one of the terms for split cord malformation. Um, that's where the word comes from. So it's a, I like to do case-based learning. So this is uh, not the patient, but she looks very similar to that. 73-year-old woman who presented the office with left-sided low back pain and left lower extremity weakness. Uh, she said she had symptoms a month ago, and when she had the symptoms, they were severe, very severe, sciatica. But the symptoms are much improved. She says 90, 95% improved, improved as far as pain is concerned, but she still has some weakness. So low back pain, left, low, left sciatica, much improved, though, since she made the appointment. Unfortunately for me, when people call me, they're in terrible pain, the office. By the time they can get in to see me, all the symptoms are gone, so I can't do any surgeries, unfortunately. People usually heal themselves. That's the problem with having a busy practice, is the surgical indications go away with time. Because um, most of these people heal on their own. It just the, the symptoms go away. Past medical history, uh, she had anterior cervical fusion, cholecystectomy, emphysema, low thyroid. Her medications were prolastin, levothyroxine, hydrochlorothiazide, metoprolol, succin, ADR. Venlafaxine, uh, potassium chloride, and trazodone. She has algae and morphine. On a, uh, she was a <coughs> smallish woman, 5 feet 1 inches, 145 pounds. She had an obvious Trendelenburg list. So, a Trendelenburg list is when you step your lip. Do you want to describe it? Trendelenburg list? Um, it's due to hip adductor weakness. Um, yeah. So, when you stand on, when you are in single leg stands, you end up having a lurch. Yeah, so when you stand on your one leg and the other leg's off the ground, so you're just standing on one leg, single leg stance. Yeah, you usually list, there's two different ways to, to turn There's two it. things that can happen, can right? list this way to take the pressure off the... Okay, so the, the first, one, is first one is when people, when people go towards the bad leg, and why do they do that? So that they the center arm, of balance. So that they take so the pressures off because they can't control. Yeah, so their center of balance is, is over their leg, and it, you don't need a hip abductor if right. you do that. And then the other way you can do it is this way. You just fall. And people who step in the leg, they don't, they don't do that. They just fall when they, they do just it. Yeah, so the, yeah, the people who just fall aren't as with it as the people who list. Because it's a compensation they can correct for themselves so they don't fall over. Yeah, so a child will never fall. A child always compensates and, and, and keeps going strong. So it tells you the vitality of the person, I think. <clears throat> when they just fall, that means they're not as strong as somebody who lists. Somebody who lists, they're moving. They can, they can walk pretty quickly with that. So she, had a <clears throat> she, she fell, actually. When she walked, she sort of collapsed. So she was kind of a weak. <clears throat> but, you know, she's an older person. I think the younger people tend to, or the vibrant people, or the younger people tend to, tend to <coughs> do you agree with that or disagree? <clears throat> um, they probably do tend to compensate more. The younger people. Yeah. No? Yeah, just because we don't see the younger people that much. But, you know. You've never seen polio and, um, um, you know, that one guy with cerebral polio, palsy. We have now <coughs> polio and, and he, but he patients with cere people, people with cerebral people. palsy, people who do that are people who've had it all their lives, like cerebral palsy, myelomalingocele, right. polio. Those people, from childhood, they children are resilient. <coughs> but if it happens in an older age, they, they just don't do it. They're weaker. As we get older, we know we get weaker. So um, she had a lisp. Uh, her left hip abductors, she could not stand on a single leg. So I, my test for to see how strong, when I see that, I was like, hmm, abductor weakness. So <clears throat> my test is just uh, lift up one leg and see what happens. If they lift up one leg and they f it falls, <clears throat> hip abductors are weak. 
much better test than try to do it with your hands. It's hard. It's hard for people to to see how strong you are. I mean, you can do it, but it's easier and quicker to do it that way. I think just to lift, and then to see how if they're super strong, if you want to test it, is have them hop on it. So if they can hop on it, that means the abductor is firing. So it's it's like you know level of strength, and then to see and see if they and to really test it. Another way to test a single leg stance, I push them. So I push them and I see how much balance they, they have if, they, if it fires. So if I can, if I like, if, if Brian did it, stood on one leg and I pushed him, he won't fall. Like he can just fire that muscle and stay uh, standing. You guys ever do that or no? Mm -hmm. no it's just, a, it's just a way to test how strong you are. Because we have more time, we will lay them down really yeah. and put them in the right position to test their abductor. Yeah, and do a formal. You have to really push hard. Yeah. Okay, so and her left ankle dorsiflexion was two out of five motor. So uh, my impression in this, she had she had an L5 radiculopathy clinically, and when she came in, people do an intake exam. This was her drawing, which uh, Aaron, if you if you saw that drawing, what, what nerve do you think that is? L5. 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 Yeah, lateral malleolus, lateral border of the foot, maybe S1. A lot of times the drawing tells you what's wrong. So here are the X-rays, Aaron. Um, Tell me uh, what you see here on the side view, on the lat on the on the AP view on the left. What do you see? Uh, scoliosis. A little bit of scoliosis. Okay. Um, on the lateral view, uh, deep, uh, with, uh, probably an old compression fracture at L three. The L three vertebra is slightly decreased in height. Yeah, some anterior osteophytes. L1, some L1, yeah, some two, diffuse two, anterior two, osteophytes. Now, how about comment on the uh, uh, T12L1 disc space up, up uh, here? Yeah, yeah, I see. Comment on the disc space here. Increased. <coughs> Can you see it? Not really. Not really, right? Can't really see a disc space there. Okay. Um, some similar findings here, right? Can't really, a T12L1, can't really see a disc space. Right. And on the lateral view, not too contributory, I, I thought, just kind of a standard. So she comes in with an MRI scan. She was referred by a primary care physician because she had a sciatic <coughs> radiculopathy, it wasn't getting better. So what do you see on these sagittal cuts, Aaron? What are your thoughts? First of all, let's stick with the same um, concept of the T12L1 disc space. Can you please comment okay. on the T12L1 disc space? Why isn't there a disc space? What is that? Uh, no disc. I mean, is it a cold compression fracture or a hemivertebra? Uh, so it could be a deformity, like a, a congenital deformity. Not a hemivertebra, but like a congenital deformity. So maybe a failure of uh, segmentation uh, that she had since birth. Okay. And the other thing, why can't you see the spinal cord in the nerve roots? Do you have any, any ideas? It could be from the scoliosis, mm -hmm. but here, it, w one thing that's that I thought was weird is is this right here, is you never see that because uh, it's just the way the way scoliosis works. You can't see the spinal cord twice unless you have an ex extremely sharp curve. It's impossible to see the spinal cord twice if it goes in and out of a plane like that. Um, when I first saw it, I thought something's not right here. Also, the spinal cord, where does the spinal cord usually end? Conus. L1. L1, L2, right? So this spinal cord goes all the way down to what looks like L2, L3, doesn't it? So it's much lower, although that does happen. Okay, so something's not right in her spine. How about the, the, this view? So where you can see clearly now, where does the spinal cord end? About the L3, yeah, about the L3 pedicle. See it right there? which is uh, much lower than usual. Uh, and again, on this view, why, why does the spinal cord go in and out of the image? Well, you know. Well, I know now. Yeah, but it's kind of weird, right? It goes in and out of the image. Okay. So let's start, I usually start, so any questions so far? So I usually start from the bottom and go up when I read MRIs usually, on the axial cuts anyway. So this is L5S1. 
The foramen on the right looks open. Right there, this is this is the foramen. Um, and the foramen on the left, Aaron, what do you think? Uh, looks, compressed. looks compressed. So the L5S1 foramen is compressed. Does that correspond to our symptoms? Yes. Yeah, so basically for us as clinicians, stop right there. That's probably her whole problem. Um, a foraminal disc or foraminal stenosis. How about the level of the L5 pedicle? Anything abnormal? You think the thecal sac is normal size or big? Normal. Normal. I think it's. A, I'm gonna have to disagree with you. I think it's a little bit big. Usually, usually it's round. Um, and this, see how it's not round? It's oblong, and it's like more. And all. And there's this, this residual posterior element right here, which is usually not present. Um, usually they're in the middle. So it's a. It looks a little bit like a like a tethered cord like a phylum terminale, like a, a residual a neurological structure from the conus that goes all the way down that can happen in children, L a little bit like that. So again, this is the L4, L5 disc, which again, it looks elongated in the back. This looks deformed, L4 pedicle. L3, L4, any abnormalities? Other than again, this neural, there's a neurological element there that looks like a phylum terminality. It looks like an abnormal neurological structure, like tethering the um, conus. And here's the conus, beginning of the conus. And again, is there one conus or there's two conus? See it? I see it. The yeah, two or three. Like looks like two there, doesn't it? Now, what do you think of that? Definitely two, right? So um, that's at the level of uh, L2. And here it's obviously two spinal cords, right? In the spinal canal, a large spinal canal. And we'll, the, there seems to be nerve roots um, lateral, but no nerve roots medial. See the little dots, lateral, nerve roots lateral, but nothing, nothing medial. So there's nerve roots coming off laterally but not medially those spinal cords so here what do you see here Aaron? two separate spinal cords with and fecal sacs two different fecal sacs right and what's in the middle there bone. what yeah it's bone in the middle what is that <laughs> yeah so um so when I when I first saw this, I looked at it. I was like, I, th I thought to myself, is this some kind of error <laughs> in the move? In the he, she moved in the scanner. Does it got some kind of like? And then I and then I uh, I looked at the report. I let me look at the radiologist report. And I always wait to read the radiologist report last. I read the ra radiologist report. They didn't even comment on anything. It was like nothing. I was like, am I going crazy here? I, I think I'm seeing two. So I took my glasses off. I wiped them off. <laughs> I put them back on. I was like, "Yeah, I see too." Okay, and, and it's se and it's septated. <coughs> Same thing here, right? This is at T12, uh, T11. T uh, actually, that was this is L1. This is around T12 L1, where remember there was a failure of segmentation, and this is going up towards 11. So they kind of like come together now. So this is a a, cor uh, a coronal split. That's not so helpful, just shows the scoliosis. But here you can see the spinal canal and a piece of bone in the middle of it and the spinal cord separating. See, that's the bone in the middle that we saw before. And these are two spinal cords on either end. So I saw this MRI. I said, this is definitely not, I was like, did you, I told the woman, that she's like just a typical woman from Hartford County, nothing, nothing special about her. Like, do you know you have two spinal cords? Is anybody? She goes, what? I was like, oh, have you ever known any? No. She's like, like what are you talking about? I, like, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. So I went back, and then I was like, let me let me look at one more study. So luckily, I could pull her previous studies from a CAT scan for low back pain done five years ago. And sure enough, the CAT scan shows this uh, bone septum at that one level, separating the two spinal cords. So it wasn't an error in the cat. This, I was like, oh, wait a minute, this is a, this is a deformity. This is not my imagination. Did that CT scan five years ago comment on it? 
can't remember. At that point, I was I didn't read the report. I just knew those diets from Atomyelia. So, and, and here's uh, more CAT scans. And this is just the um, uh, uh, sagittal cut, which shows the failure of the disc base. So, uh, at that point, uh, I, I knew it was diastomatomyelia. I mean, I had to think back 20 years ago from residency when I'd last seen this. And I, and I Googled it and I searched it and I was like, yeah, this is most definitely it. So, um, the first person to describe it was Charles Prosper Olivier Danger, 1796 to 1845. He first wrote about diastomatomyelia and spinal cord dysraphism. And he, at the age of 17, he was uh, in Napoleon's army and he was an officer. And he was present at the Battle of Waterloo, which, you know, who won that? Who won that? Wellington or Napoleon? Wellington won, so Napoleon lost, so he got upset, and uh, everything was disrupted in France. He quit the army. He's like, "This is I'm done with the army. I mean, this is this is not France's time anymore. We're done." So then he went into medicine because his father was a pharmacist, and um, he became um, a practitioner. He was a me a medical doctor, practitioner, an anatomist, and a pathologist. He studied embryology, and he basically devoted his life to this. Uh, research of the spinal cord and he wrote uh, a book about deformities of the spinal cord and the spinal cord and um, he had three different um, editions of it and he first uh, coined the term syringomyelia or you know, fluid within the spinal canal and he described uh, spinal dy dysraphisms interestingly he had no microscope he was doing this with his eyes and di dissecting just with his eyes and interestingly, if you Google his name, you can find the book. The, the whole book is online, which is amazing, right? From, uh, uh, I think it was 1840 or something. It, and, and that's the actual, on the right, that's the actual cover of the book in the library. And it's in, it's in Paris, but Google, Google does this thing where they copy all the books, and they're all online for you, all these historic books. I, I thought that was kind of amazing. So there's different ways to describe this. You can describe it diastomatomyelia, which when I was a resident was a split cord malformation with, with a bone in the middle of it, a bony septum in the middle of it. And then there's another way of describing diplomyelia, which is just doubling of the cord. Diplomyelia usually just had nothing in the middle or just a fibrous septum. And there's, there are nerve roots both um, medially and laterally, while in diastomatomyelia just uh, nerve roots laterally, like in our case. Uh, but in 1992, um, there was an article. There's a, a a big article written about the um, concept about the uh, this problem, and um, I'll tell I'll tell you the name of the article in a minute. But they defined it more as just split cord malformations, and there's one and two. One is when you have two hemicords, individual dural tubes, midline osteocartilaginous spur, which is our case. And the second type is two hemicords, but a single dural tube and a non-fibrous uh, septum, a non-rigid fibrous septum. So this is this is a cartoon, which uh, shows you on the left is a type one split cord malformation, or what we used to call diastomatomyelia. You can see there's a bony spur between the two spinal cords, um, uh, and you can see it on CT, obviously, because it's made of bone, and it's usually lumbar. And then type two, uh, a single dural sleeve. Um, and they're separated by a fibrous band attached to the dura, um, and it can it can occur anywhere in the spinal axis. So, so like a doubling or a splitting of the spinal cord. Can you guys think of um, anything else that can double in the body like this or split? Ure ureter for one. Ureters. So like one yeah. side can have two ureters. Right. Is that Correct. I've never seen that. Is it? Is it? Have you seen one it? One side. Yeah. Can I have two of you? Yeah. Yeah, my mother had that. Your mother had that? How would you know that? She had a seat. She, she had. Uh, she had a. Uh, she had a test. Retrograde uh, or something like that. Some study. Mm hmm Retrograde uh, pilogram. Hmm. Okay. And this was before CAT scans. Mm hmm uh, What uh, What other? Do you guys know any other mouth? I know me. Per I have a malformation. Ever tell you, Aaron? Did I tell you about my malformation? There's a lot you don't know about me. I have two renal arteries on one side. Well, that counts for something. <laughs> I had an angiogram when I was in medical school. The 
because I, I had a high blood pressure. And um, they wanted to rule out renal artery stenosis. And so things can double or split. And, and hmm? Can't you have three kidneys? Three people have three kidneys. I'm not sure. I know you can have one kidney, like a, like a horseshoe kidney that goes all the way around. I'm not sure. Maybe. Um, I know you can have three testicles. I mean, things can split. So, so bones, bones. Um, I don't have three testicles. Bones can um, usually split. Th this deformity happens in utero around day 18. So very, very early. Dastomatomalia, yeah, day 18 in, in the embryo. So that's kind of amazing how early this, uh, this uh, bony deformity is. Um, so here's just another case of dastomatomalia in, a, in a, a casket in a child. You can see that the, the, the uh, bony spur. So the, the split cord malformation description was um, written in 1992 uh, by Pang, and he was from uh, Pittsburgh, and also his collaborators were from uh, Chicago, from Children's Hospital of Chicago. And these uh, deformities, spinal dysphraphism deformities, are commonly associated with hypertrichosis, or hair, basically, over the, where the spinal bifida is. Why that is, it's got something to do with uh, the embryo. It's like a neuroectodermal cells. Uh, our patient didn't have that. I looked, she didn't have any hair there. But that's very common. Have you, has anyone seen that before? I, I, when I was in residency, we, I saw them. So there's different, there's different types of uh, spinal dys dysraphism. Uh, Myeloma meningocele, diastomatomia, like we have, mild dysplasia. And this is just, she shows the anatomy of two different in a, in, a, in a case like this, two different uh, neural two, uh, dural sleeves at the level of the deformity. And it has to do with the way that the neural plate and groove um, form. Um, the neural plate folds in and becomes a neural groove and that becomes the uh, central nervous system. And as you can see, this is the embryo at day 18 and day 20. So basically over the, I mean, the whole thing is absolutely amazing that these cells know how to do this sort of thing. It's just that fold over and become spinal cords. It's just unbelievable. And did you read it? Did you read in the, in the internet that someone grew human cell, an embryo in vitro? Did you, did you read that? It's like scary, like recently. Uh, and they formed the uh, spinal cord system. So let me see if I can get this to work. This is a video I have. Sorry guys, I tried to implant the, oh, maybe. Oh. I tried to implant the, um, 